Here's the story of a person living beside the Myra Quarry, located just outside of Fredericton, on the railroad. In 2014, the quarry was given speedy approval to do business in a protected area for environment over the third largest aquifer in Canada and to disturb the quality of life for many people living along the railroad. The whole process violated all kinds of rules and there's been no transparency and no accountability as to how that happened in the first place. Over the past six years, that quarry has been protected and no one can figure out why. But the people who live there have not been protected by the Department of Health, Department of Environment, Department of Natural Resources, or any other political means to try to get some sense of justice, some sense of accountability, some change. So here's their story, first person, like a victim impact statement. It would be really nice if you could feel what they feel and imagine what it's like to live there and to know that this could happen in your backyard just as easily. The fact that this is a privately owned company that's gotten into your backyard and your neighbor's backyards yes. and totally changed your life. Well, uh, when it started um, uh, back prior to 2009, um, Adrian Pembridge, who is the owner of Myra Construction, uh, started to um, uh, assemble uh, land and uh, the land uh, without anybody knowing and uh, it was a kind of a private thing and, uh, and in this land like should it have been public Sh should people have known the acquisition of that hill um, no but uh, he didn't want anybody to know because it's uh, it's a competition thing with the uh, quarries uh, keep it quiet and you can uh, maybe get the hands up on another uh, another company so yep. it was uh, and of course you know you get the people once they find out uh, like us the, uh, how much fuss they put up about it and uh, it's uh, it's just uh, that's the way it worked all the way through this here um, you have to know where the rock is and he found out the rock first where it is he's got to have financing so he's got to have somebody backing him and his own money and he's got to have influence with somebody at the top or somebody that knows people at the top of government that will help him. And uh, this all took place. Um, Adrian Pembridge knew which buttons to push. And how to work the system. That's right, that's correct. And it started back uh, actually with the Allward government. David Allward and um, and actually Blaine Higgs was in that government as finance minister and uh, and friends and bureaucrats. The bureaucrats were there when it got going. They, uh, they actually, uh, from what we've seen, helped move us along fairly easily. Mm -hmm. And um, You mean the application for the quarry? Application for the quarry, anything they did, uh, didn't seem to take get drawn out. It took um, probably less than a year, a year to get everything going. And no transparency. Isn't the civil service obliged to provide a certain amount of transparency? Let people know. They they are, and they did. Uh, in the beginning, they had the public meeting, and uh, we had well, 99 percent of the people at the public meeting were against it, mm. and we had petitions. We had. Uh, uh, pictures. We had uh, many people speak about it, and um, they were all against this. Uh, and it was um, there was one gentleman there that had a truck, and he was for it, and he had the right to speak about it. Uh, it was his business, and um, but when it went through to um, the PRAC, is the next step. And the PRAC is, if you're not familiar with the PRAC, it is called. Uh, the Planning Review Adjustment Commission. And uh, the Regional Service Commission 11 is the ones that uh, determine whether this is going to um, be good for the community. Uh, and they would, uh, <coughs> they would put it through. Uh, Steve McAlinden, it was the director of the Regional Service Commission. And he actually told me that um, they thought this would be a good idea. Yeah, and that gets into defining the good. 
That's right. Like what is yeah, the good? what is the good? And uh, of course, nobody in this in this whole thing determined that they were putting this quarry. I should say they putting this gravel pit. That's how it started off. Mm. Uh, on a hill overlooking a valley with a hill on the other side so that echoes would take place and uh, the uh, the wind generally it's out of the southwest would follow in on the, on the valley. So um, that went through and it went through to the prac and within a short amount of time uh, Eldon Hunter was the um, the leader of the prac at that time I don't know his title but, um, and there was only one gentleman that uh, declined because he lived in Stanley. His name was Mike Chamberlain. And he knew, um, he knew the highway out there and what kind of trouble all those trucks would do uh, on this curved road and everything like that. So um, he voted against it. Everybody else voted for it, even though we gave them all this information and the petitions and everything like that. They kind of rushed that through. Uh, had to go to um, the Environment Minister, Dan Soucy, and he signed it over before that election, which they lost. So I would, um, I would like to just uh, draw a path here of people who, um, who put this through. Uh, some had more to do with it than others. Some were just uh, employees of the government. and. Um, it started with the Allward government. There was David Allward, uh, Blaine Higgs we know, Dan Soucy, uh, Troy Lifford was the MP for the area in Douglas, uh, which put it through so he would have known about it. MP or MLA? Uh, he's an MLA, um, not our, our part, but Kirk McDonald was our MLA yep. and he should have known about it too. Yep. Good. Um, Regional Service Commission, there was Dallas Gillis, Steve McAllen and Rob Kelly. They were all part of it. Uh, and then we also had the prac which Eldon Hunter and uh, the Unbudsman knew about it, Charles Murray. So there it went through to the Liberal government uh, and the Liberal government, uh, Brian Glant, would not talk to any of us. They were quiet, uh, they just uh, kind of rode the wave and um, Many things happened in that government. Uh, Brian Glantz, Stephen Horseman, uh, Kelly Simmons, the bureaucrats uh, got into it. They knew what was going on right from the very beginning. Uh, Perry Haynes, Brian Kenny, Minister of Environment. Serge Roussel was another Minister of Environment. And then the regulars in the Regional Service Commission, Steve uh, McAlinden. And uh, the next big step was the water course and wetland alteration because they had to get across the stream, the Nashwaxis stream. So uh, Peter McDougal was the director of that at that time. Um, and it's funny, on, on that, we did so much investigation that we had uh, employees that retired in that, uh, in that department. And they, they said many corners were cut to get this across the Nashwaxis stream. But they weren't able to say that publicly. They couldn't, no, no. Um, and there was a, there was a plan set out for the construction of the Bailey Bridge. Um, they had to uh, dry piles for it the proper way. That was never done. Um, but those are big trucks going over that bridge. Yes, they are. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And some people thought it was a temporary bridge, but I guess it's there for as long as the quarry's there. Department of Transport was the next one. Uh, Norm Clouston was head. Sebastian Roy, Peter Wood, Veronica Pelkey, Rick McCracken, they were all involved in this. Uh, and that was a real mess for the access road. Um, the, uh, the fellow that was working for the DOT at that time came out and inspected that road. And uh, we had talked to him, he could not find an access point uh, that would give the right sight distance for that road. Um, so he declined it um, and um, that wasn't to happen because they wanted to get the quarry started. So uh, they had a private company come out uh, that was looking after the bridge and they took his word that the access road uh, was correct. 
So they opened it. They approved it, uh, which was wrong again because we put pressure on them. They come back and they declined it. It wasn't right. So they did that three times um, between uh, Sebastian Roy and Peter Wood and Veronica Pelkey. Uh, they really got nervous because they knew we were on the case about it. They sent emails saying the pressure's on. We better go out and check this road again. So, uh, you know, what do you think of them? You know, like the, it seems to us like they're making things happen for Myra. Um, the next part was environment. Uh, Jennifer Bishop uh, was the engineer at that time. Talked to her many times. Told her the turtles were there. She didn't seem to think it mattered. Um, Serge Gagnon was another one. Um, Rhonda Morrill, Matthew Evans, Jeff Williams are all inspectors for environment. Talked to them almost every day. Um, and they, um, they, they didn't know a lot about it and they just kept putting us off saying, you know, this is, this is, this is going to be good. You know, we're watching them. Um, uh, the streams there, we'll watch the stream. And uh, uh, it, uh, it never took place. Jennifer eventually left that department. Um, and I even have um, a quote from Jennifer Bishop which says, this is a quote for her, Department of Environment, I am wondering about groundwater quality monitoring. Is it, being, is it going to be done or is it being done? It was never done. The department comes out now, they take uh, two glassfuls of water, running water, and they take it back. And that, that's all they do. They don't watch the runoff uh, before rain. They don't watch that. Um, they, they um, well, here is what they, they're supposed to do. Emissions, dust, noise, public safety standards, and inspections. Another engineer at that time, Don Fox, said, Nashwalk Stream is in the vicinity of Myra Quarry. Care should be taken to ensure possible contamination does not reach the stream, which it does. Mm -hmm. Uh, sand is a big problem in the stream coming off the hill. Um, the bridge is a big problem in the winter time. They plow all the dirty snow, the grease, the oil, the dust into the stream. Uh, they did that for five years until we took pictures of it and took it back to Jeff Carr and then they stopped them from doing that. Now they're piling them back on the road. In the beginning, they would truck, uh, would, they would back their water truck down in the stream, suck the water off, out of the stream. Um, until we, we noticed that, took pictures of it, and, um, and that was eventually stopped. Um, because I had asked one of the inspectors from environment, can I do the same thing? Can I take water of the stream to water my garden? And his words were, uh, if it's a small amount, you're not allowed to take uh, a large amount of water out of the stream. So he said you could do it with for maybe for your garden. So, Is there any way to find out how much water the quarry pulls anyway on a typical day? Because quar quarries require water. Well, they certainly do. And they're, and they're supposed to be using a lot now on the, on the floor of the quarry up there. Um, they've made two ponds uh, in different parts of the quarry. The water truck has to go down and, and suck it out of there now and spread it on the quarry. So I don't know how much they use. They must have used a, a quite, a bit, quite a bit. Um, it's because um, uh, I, I watch them every day and I see, um, uh, see them spraying the ground. I see them spraying the road. Um, not all the time, but uh, they do it. My wife mentioned to me that uh, uh, things didn't look right in the house. We were getting staining in the sinks and the toilets and the showers and that. And she said, I think we should have our water tested. Uh, previously, um, just before the quarry started, uh, we dug a new well and uh, we had a test, the water tested from the well. Everything was fine. Uh, so then the quarry uh, got going and we, uh, the first year of the quarry, we had it tested again because we, we had to put a softener in because our water was hard. Uh, everything was fine in the, in the water 
at that time. So uh, when uh, she noticed that, we decided to call um, a company, a reputable company that uh, does this, and to come out and test our water. And um, they gave me a printout. They said our water had drastically gone downhill. Um, it was bad. Uh, we shouldn't really be drinking it because it was, uh, there was a lot of manganese in it, two forms of iron. And um, they, uh, they made us aware of what this does to you. Uh, can cause memory loss, uh, senility. And here we've been drinking that for four years now. Uh, I asked them what would cause that. And um, they said probably a, a lot of uh, house construction or a lot of wells being drilled in the area. And, uh, and I said, what else? And he says, well, a disruption of the ground. And I said, well, the only thing I could think would be the quarry in back of us. And um, of course, they didn't want to say that it was the quarry, but um, uh, there's no houses being built because nobody would live there. So it's, um, it's, it's very, um, very dangerous to be drinking water like that. And uh, along with the, the dust for our health and the noise, now we got to think about our water. Yep. The, uh, and that's a fundamental. Is the quarry on an aquifer? Is the, the, is the rock above an aquifer? The, uh, yes, it is. There's an aquifer, and that's what our well is into, the aquifer. So it's the same water source. Same water source, it's yeah. Just to be clear, yep. so the, the yep. quarry is banging away yep. above and, the same aquifer. And of course, there is a groundwater it. source, too. The stream yep. is groundwater. So, so what has changed our water in four years that bad, you know? So. Um, Any other neighbors get their wells tested yet? They are getting them tested now. Dennis, I want to say there's a few more names I'd like to mention here uh, leading on to that. Uh, Charles Murray was in on the Liberal government too, so we talked to him many times. Um, he uh, could not do anything for us. He told us that uh, he had no voice with Brian Glenn. Um, and then the PCs were in opposition at that time, and we, we talked to um, Blaine Higgs and Kirk McDonald. Blaine said that he would help us. Um, which, and he thought, he said he would enforce the rules more for um, things that weren't uh, taken correctly or weren't done at the quarry. Uh, and then Blaine got into um, power and uh, it was the same old people that uh, from Regional Service Commission, from the Planning Commission, from the PRAC, the Ombudsman were all the same people that followed this right through and helped us go through. Um, I'd also like to say that um, uh, the Green Party could have done more to help uh, the environment here. We have, we have five species that are endangered in the stream. Nobody is helping them. Uh, uh, we have just go gone through, um, or I should say the Nova Scotia government has just gone through where they were charged for not doing enough for their endangered species. Mm. Well, what is the New Brunswick government doing? You know, I'm down there every day checking my land. Uh, I've done inspections for the government back when they're trying to get a count on them. Mm -hmm. There's nobody down there that are helping uh, these turtles or checking to see if it's going to endanger them. Mm -hmm. I, I know the stream has tons of sand in it now that is washed down off the hill. Mm -hmm. I don't know what else to have in the sand in the, in the stream, but it's it's it. And it's a protected waterway, right? Protected waterway. Trees are protected. The butternut trees, they're all dying there. You know, it could be from a disease. Maybe it's from all the dust comes down. I don't know, but I see it happening. Um, so it's, uh, you know, I mentioned the Green Party. David Kuhn should have picked up on this. And he should, you know, that's what his, his party is. Environment. Well, why wouldn't you be out there, you know, helping us? I know he didn't get the MP he wanted in there, a very smart lady, but it's environment. Okay, this, uh, this happens almost every day at my house. Uh, I can do the front of the house or the back. This is from the back. This is my furniture. And um, how this happens is from, the dust rises from the quarry, no matter if it's watered or not. Um, and this, um, this comes down on our furniture, it comes down on our gazebo, it comes down on our deck, and it's white. 
and um, I have people out from environment uh, almost all the time. Uh, they've taken hundreds of pictures of this over the last six years, and uh, nobody in environment will do anything about it. They don't want to know about it. They've never come out to see my property or to see what we're going through. Um, the only one that did come out was Jeff Carr, and that was in the winter when nothing was going on. And then he came out one night after the quarry was closed. It was pitch dark, and nothing happened there. So this is what we go through all the time. Um, um, what period of time was this tile out for? That, that, uh, I took that uh, out there after the blast, which got covered. I cleaned it, and then I put it back out, so that would be two to three days. Okay. Yeah. And it would be in your backyard, front yard, or it doesn't matter? That, this is in the backyard. <laughs> yeah. This is in the backyard. And uh, we try to spend a lot of time out there because of uh, the weather, but it's hard with the noise, with the um, piercing noise from drilling and from the vacuums there. And it's, it's just very difficult to enjoy it out there. Yeah. So every day or two. Every day or two, you've yeah. You've got that much dust on everything yep. around your house. Yep. And we can talk about out front, which is, uh, you know, there is, um, if anybody can believe, five to six hundred trucks a day. Uh, do you know what kind of noise that brings and what kind of dust they pull with them? Um, and we have lots of pictures. I have proof of everything. Uh, dust, uh, you know, flies off the trucks. Uh, even sometimes if they have the trucks covered, uh, the dust flies off, the rocks come out of the tires. If I'm mowing the lawn, you can hear, Phew, there goes a rock. Or you're hitting it with your, your lawnmower because you're, you're, you're mowing near the road. I would say they come in anywhere from uh, 10 to 20 feet off the road. Uh, they've hit the car in the driveway. Um, uh, rocks are a big problem. Uh, I, I've picked up four pound rocks beside a school bus that have come off a truck. There's supposed to be provincial legislation about a tarp or a canopy that goes over the top of a load yes. on an open. Yep. Do, you, do they do that? Most, most of them don't. I, I Honestly, I do see some. Uh, some of the Hogan trucks, uh, have the, the dump trucks, which are the big ones, have it. And um, uh, there's still dust uh, coming out the back of those trucks, but a lot of the smaller ones, uh, they just let it fly. The government is good at this there. They, they, they know when to do a test in, in their favor. Uh, they did a test in the fall, September to December, when it's not peak time. They do averaging. And what the averaging is, and I don't know a lot about this, but I, I've looked into it a little bit. They may take a, a, peri a 24 hour period. And if there is uh, a lot of dust from say 10 in the morning till four in the afternoon, uh, for the six hours, they, um, they average that over 24 hours so that it reduced the amount of um, figures or, or calculations that it shows uh, how bad the dust was. Um, can't tell you more than that, but they do that with the noise too. And um, uh, they're pretty good at doing that. Like we've had a test in 2016 um, which they say everything was normal in it, but they didn't do fine particulate. Uh, and then they did this one in 2019 in the fall, uh, which they say, oh yeah, some things went over, but it didn't look that bad. Uh, the noise, it was over some here and that it didn't look that bad. And uh, so, you know, they, they have ways of doing things that make the company that doing this look better. This is the sixth year, and the environment says they have everything fixed now. They, 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 there shouldn't be any dust. Um, they chip sealed the row going up to the quarry, which was good. I, I can't say it's not, but uh, we were hoping it would help. Um, it did um, for a week or a week and a half, and then the trucks start dragging it back down the hill again. And, and it's been dry and hot, and, and, and dust is bad this time of year. Mm -hmm. But they're watering up there, and uh, every day, environment, I call environment, the dust is rising. We have videos of this here. 
and uh, we can taste that in our mouth, in our teeth, it grinds. When you grind your teeth, you, you feel it. And this is ridiculous. This is, uh, they want us to breathe this here. Uh, a lot of older people up there, um, they come to me and they don't know what to do. Some of them are crying. Um, the stress alone, without the dust, without the noise, is a killer, you know. Um, and I, I can't understand Blaine Higgs, Jeff Carr, any of them, or their predecessors, uh, letting this happen um, unless, you know, somebody with influence for my reconstruction is, uh, they're not going to stop it. They're, they're not going to help it, us. And politicians kind of come and go, but the civil service has been there for a long time. So what about them as well, but the frustration with them? It's the bureaucrats that I think run, run the government. Um, they, they know what's going on. I've talked to them many times. They, it's like going into a meeting and they like to gang up on you. There might be seven of those people for one of me. And uh, of course, I have to lose my temper at that time. And, and some of them actually, uh, some of the guys that did testing there, uh, when this first started, they didn't even look at the watershed. They admit that they should have done that. And why did Adrian Pembridge not have to do an EIA? The government says, well, we didn't know there was any uh, endangered species there. But yet, when we put pressure on the government, then when Jeff Calder tried to get Spring Hill in, they said, oh no, now you have to do an EIA. Why? Because the residents put up enough stink that they changed their rules. So the government changed the rules that quick. And it's, um, it's just, just didn't solve the problem for you, did didn't it? Didn't solve the problem, no. They just cut uh, Spring Hill out. And of course, he can, he can reapply for a rezoning. We don't know what's going to happen there. So in, in 2009, it could have been before that, but in 2009, uh, if I'm not mistaken, Myra uh, wanted to start a gravel pit. Myra Construction owner, Adrian Pembridge, wanted to start a gravel pit. But it, it, uh, I have 10. Um, probably ten, uh, eight or ten documents here. Uh, first was April 15th in 2009 rezoning application. It was going to be an office, a ready mix shop, a, a gravel source, and a construction yard. So then they put the rezoning report out on that. The re re rezoning report said that the gravel, it was going to be a gravel extraction, accessory buildings, two deposits of gravel, which they had a map showing the gravel deposits. Next was in April 2009, there was a rezoning uh, proposal to remove gravel from the area. Um, this was put forward by Dallas Gillis, but they talk about gravel again. Next was in July, Bernie Hogetson, Department of Environment, an application to rezone lands again, but it was also for a gravel pit. Alex Forbes, who was with the city, he's a, one of the planners there, was, um, was worried about the Claudie Road and they, uh, they also had talked to Adrian Pembridge and it was going to be a gravel pit. Uh, and it went on like that again the next time. It was always a gravel pit. Uh, there's another one here, Gary Hallett rezoning gravel pit. Alex Forbes again, a gravel pit. And uh, Dallas Gillis uh, in the Rural Planning Commission, uh, impending zoning for a gravel pit. There's 10 different documents saying gravel pit. Where does the quarry come into this? And the difference between a quarry and a gravel pit? Uh, there's blasting in there too. Okay, they want to do the, have to do the blasting. So this was never brought up to us. Uh, then all of a sudden, I think it was Steve McAlinden said that, oh no, this is going to be a quarry with blasting. Well, we didn't know that. And um, it just seemed like uh, they were trying to hide uh, a quarry, bring it in as a gravel pit and then work it into a quarry. Helmyra must have friends because they, they're not assessed any penalties for anything they do. Um, First off, when he first started the, the first blast, I think it was in uh, late fall, maybe December, I'm not sure, but anyway, 
uh, they give regulations, uh, environment gives regulations, so they can't go over certain specs to protect the houses from cracking and vibration like that. Um, the first uh, blast I had was over. And um, uh, we were sitting in my house, and I, actually I had somebody from the environment, and um, he just said, wow, he said, that's, uh, that's very powerful. And he says, uh, I said, well, it shook the whole house. And um, I said, what do you say about that? And he said, well, that's above my pay grade. I can't tell you anything else about that. Uh, so there was two of those blasts. That was the first year. Like the second year, there was another one that was well over two. Um, September the 4th in 14, uh, this is with a complaint. Using the Claudie Road to transport Agrega to um, wherever it was going. Uh, they were not supposed to transport it on the Cloudy Road. Uh, it got back to the city and Regional Service Commission. Um, Steve McAlinden had to send them a letter saying that their rezoning would be uh, would be cancelled if they keep doing uh, rock aggregate down the Cloudy Road. They knew they weren't supposed to do that, yet they kept doing it. Um, Trucks are going non-stop using the Cloudy Road to transport marketable material starting early as 6 o'clock in the morning, June 23rd, 2015. That's the next year. May 2015, this is from Sean Lee of the City of Fredericton. The use of the Cloudy Road to transport material mined from the gravel pit, gravel pit, is not permitted. He had to step in. July 2015, MCL management which is Myra construction, a need to abide by the laws or it could have an impact on the rezoning. So they were threatened to stop the rezoning. Fall of 2019, October and November, the quarry were starting early um, operation loading trucks. And um, this I witnessed for two and a half to three weeks. I took a video of it. The video uh, <coughs> at that time of year is a little dark in the mornings. Uh, you could see the trucks going up very early. Uh, you could see the trucks being loaded and coming down to the weigh scales before seven, waiting there till seven and then going. Uh, I have a video, I told Environment <coughs> and I told Regional Service Commission Steve McAlinden that I had this video. I would not show Steve McAlinden the video because we've had our problems with him not doing things before. So I showed it to Daniel Daly, the engineer with Environment, and he watched it at my house and he agreed they were starting early. How long it was, I don't know, two or three weeks. Uh, nothing come out of this either. They would not do anything about it. I asked them to go back and get the weigh scale loads when they checked through the scales, which, which would have 7 o'clock on it, a loaded truck at 7, and Re Myra refused to give them that. Um, many times, too, I asked them for dust records uh, that were Myra in the early A in the early years and uh, they couldn't give me dust records because they weren't done. To go back a little bit, you talked about the trucks going down the cloudy road. Yes. Were they going down the cloudy road at the same time they were coming down in your backyard? Yes, and I don't so know... So they go both directions? Yeah, I don't know why they were doing that. Um, they had the bridge in place. I know they were doing it more before the bridge was in there. Sure. Uh, but um, then the people we know over there kept complaining to us and telling us and um, so I, I don't know why they were doing that. But so somehow the people on Cloudy Road's complaint they did. had effect and the complaints for you guys right. on this new have no effect. The city of Fredericton wouldn't condone any of this because it would interfere with the enjoyment and the health of the residents on the Cloudy Road. That's exact words they said. And you guys on the Royal Road? We have to put up with whatever comes. Earlier you had mentioned uh, Mr. Pembridge owns the golf course at the top? Yes, he does. Yep. Yes, he does. He owns that and 
And when this originally started, they were worried about the wells. They wanted to test the wells. Well, he has a well on the golf course, but it's his well, so he can do what he wants with it. They never did uh, check my well. They never did check the couple houses around them, but they had uh, records of five or six wells they had checked. Um, right now, with my problems in my water, I told the, uh, the environment rep that I didn't want him to go back and tell anybody from the environment until I'm sure um, what's going on here. Um, now that everybody knows this comes out, my well is bad. Okay, and uh, other people will check theirs and then we'll go from there. Everything starts, and I'm an early riser. I don't know whether, I've always been that way. I don't know, uh, I guess I enjoy really early morning. I'm talking 4.30 in the morning when I get up. Um, every day uh, I hear, starting at probably around 6 o'clock, um, they open up the quarry. Uh, trucks, some trucks go up early, not all of them, but they they start streaming in any time after that. And there could be two or three or four or five in a row going by the house. Uh, as of right now, like in the morning, we keep our windows open to cool the house down a bit. And uh, you can't hear the TV even when those trucks go by. But anyway, these trucks uh, enter the quarry across the Bailey Bridge. So the Bailey Bridge is noisy. The trucks bang across that, go through the way scales, uh, they're not reading them at the time. They go up the hill, they lug up the hill. Some of them are very noisy. Um, trucks that you get with a quarry, some of them are brand new, some of them are very nice trucks, other ones are old beaters and they are extremely noisy. They go up and they park uh, and they back into the piles of rock or sand or whatever they want to get uh, loaded when seven o'clock comes. And there could be, uh, it could be 5, 10, 15, 20 of them up there. Uh, the workers come anytime after 6. They drive up there. Uh, in in low, slower times, there would be maybe 4 or 5 workers. Uh, they go up to 12, I think. Um, the fuel truck comes also uh, at quarter to 7. Um, they all get everything running up there and get going uh, before 7. Um, the loaders, uh, even now, the loaders uh, start a little early. Uh, they go over and they start them up, maybe warm them up for a minute, maybe two minutes. Uh, go over to the trucks, back up alarms going. They uh, may sit and talk to the drivers in the trucks for a few minutes, um, watching the clock. And um, then at uh, 7, they, uh, they dump the loads in the trucks. Uh, the dump truck is the, the big one. It takes um, uh, maybe a minute, minute uh, to two minutes to load them. Uh, they uh, motor on down the hill. Some of them use the Jake brakes. Some of them just have very squeaky brakes. And you hear them coming down the hill. And they stop at the, at the weigh scales and um, then they go from there. Um, I can usually tell when they load them early because they go by my house at 7.06. I have exactly how long it takes to get the loader warmed up to go get them and to get back by my house. And uh, Myra's boys are still pressing early. So, uh, and I can prove this. I have tapes of all this here and um, uh, the government will not do that. The government has taken over uh, kind of inspecting startup times when they do it. Uh, before it was Regional Service Commission and uh, we know what happened there. So um, they, they, haven't, they haven't checked to see how early they're starting, but they, they start early and then the trucks drive by my place with the dust and the noise and the stuff. Uh, uh, you know, and it builds up at busy times, five to six hundred a day. So, there we go, that's a typical bad day, along with all the other noises from the crusher and uh, the machinery working up there that echoes down into the valley, um, that, it is, um, that it is bad. The thing that hurts the most for me is uh, I, have, uh, I had a beautiful property. I, I really enjoyed it with the stream. Uh, I just thought it was, uh, it was a, a beautiful place to retire to enjoy, 
what was there, to have my kids enjoy it, uh, even the people around there. I did learn how it's affecting some of the older people, and, you know, and they don't like to say much. Uh, they're quiet, private. Uh, I know it's really hurting them. And uh, some of them cry to me, um, and some, um, you know, they can't, can't enjoy their home at all anymore. They, they don't know what to do. They're lost. They, they don't think they can sell their homes. And uh, some of them have got away, you know, uh, uh, people that work at night and sleep through the day can't sleep. And um, they've sold their house off, losing money on it. So the thing that really hurts me is seeing all these people suffering and nobody will do anything about it. I, I don't really want to leave, but I, I can't put up every day a hearing the trucks gear up from meeting the main road there. I hear every gear of every truck every minute uh, all day long. I can't get away from that. It's in my mind. And my wife can't either. And these people can't. So what do they do? We have to suffer with people making money and, and, and government not looking responsible for what they've done to us. They don't, th they don't think it's as bad as what we're saying. We wouldn't have kept this going for six years if it hadn't been so bad. So what else can I say, Dennis? I am thoroughly fed up with this all. And I'm really ashamed of what we have for politicians and bureaucrats.